Uh, great to see all of your uh, smiley faces. Well, some of your smiley faces. I'm, sure, I'm not sure Paul Hewitt was. Um, what I want us to think about as the service starts this morning, uh, we're going to be back in the book of Isaiah. And if uh, you've been following along with us, either in here or on the live stream, you'll have uh, picked up just these prophecies of Isaiah that he is pointing forward, pointing forward to something new. We've had wonderful prophecies about uh, restoration, prophecies that are uh, pointing people forward to a time where all evil, uh, sickness, uh, will all be done away with. Uh, There will be uh, glory, God with his people. We've also, though, been having our eyes fixed on a person, uh, someone of great importance who is going to come and bring all this together the suffering servant in Isaiah 53, and this morning, the anointed saviour in Isaiah 61. And in, in our passage today, what I want us to do is I want us to do what Isaiah wants us to do, fix our eyes on him. God's chosen one who draws near to the poor, binds the brokenhearted, and sets sinners like you and me free. As we're looking at Isaiah, there is a little bit of uh, kind of uncertainty. Who is this person? But we as New Testament believers, we, we can look back and we see Jesus. So this morning as we think about him, as we look at God's word, it's important that we remember that Jesus is that person. He is the anointed one who draws near to the poor, 
binds the brokenhearted and sets sinners like you and me free. Jesus himself stood in a synagogue and spoke the words of Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Words from Isaiah 61, and Jesus rolls up that scroll and says, Today, that has been fulfilled in your hearing. All the eyes of the synagogue were fixed on him. And so this morning, as the band sings some songs for us, and as we look at God's word, would your eyes be fixed on the Lord Jesus? I'm going to pray that that would be the case for us this morning, and the band are going to sing. Father God, we thank you for the Lord Jesus. Thank you that he is your anointed one who has come to draw near to the poor and set sinners like us free. We pray and ask that our eyes would be fixed on him this morning. Please, by your spirit, help us to see Christ for all that he truly is, the wonderful saviour. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the band are going to sing for us, Be Thou My Vision. so important that we have 
God's Spirit is helping us to fix our eyes on Jesus because I know that this week my eyes are not fixed on Jesus. And so often I am looking towards other things that seem maybe more attractive, that lead me astray. I'm sure that you too have felt that this week. And so it's important that we pray to God and we say sorry for the ways in which we have sinned and turned away from him. So I'm going to do that for us now and then we're going to sing another song. Father, we know how easy it is to maybe sit and fix our eyes on Jesus and then forget about him. We know how easy it is maybe to look at the Lord Jesus and uh, maybe miss who he is. Father, we are so sorry for the ways in which we have sinned and turned against you this past week. As we open your word and see how wonderful a saviour Jesus is, Uh, We are both uh, encouraged and also humbled by our need for him, but also his uh, willingness to draw close to us in our poverty. When we are blind to who he is, uh, you are the one who helps to open our eyes and see him. And so, Father God, please, would you uh, show us mercy? Would you point us towards the Lord Jesus today uh, and the cross of Christ? and the forgiveness that can be found there uh, forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, Jesus is all that we need, and we're going to sing, well, the band are going to lead us in a song again now, uh, Cornerstone.
His righteousness alone Faultless stand before the throne Christ alone, cornerstone Weak made strong in the same for us. We're reading from the book of Isaiah beginning at chapter 61, verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. They shall build up the ancient ruins, they shall rise up the former devastations, they shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. Strangers shall stand and tend your flocks. Foreigners shall be your plowmen and vine dressers, but you shall be called the priests of the Lord. They shall speak of you as the ministers of our God. You shall eat the wealth of the nations, and in their glory you shall boast. Instead of your shame, there shall be a double portion. Instead of dishonor, they shall rejoice in their lot. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess a double portion. They shall have everlasting joy. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrong. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their offering, offspring shall be known among the nations, and their descendants in the midst of the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge them, that they are an offspring the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful head headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its sprouts, and a garden causes what is sown in it to sprout up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before all the nations. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake, I will not be quiet until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a burning torch. The nations shall see your righteousness and all the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord. You shall no more be termed forsaken, and your land shall no more be termed desolate. 
but you shall be called, My delight is in her, and your land married. For the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. On your walls, O Jerusalem, I have set watchmen, all the day and all the night. They shall never be silent. You who put the Lord in remembrance, take no rest, and give him no rest until he establishes Jerusalem and makes it a praise in the earth. Great. Well, let me add my welcome to Marcos. It's good to have you with us here in the room and also following on the live stream. Good to have you uh, here with us this morning. We're back this morning in the book of Isaiah. So keep that passage um, open in front of you and we're going to be uh, working our way through it together. And let me pray for us and ask for the Lord's help as we do that. Let me pray. Uh, Lord God, amidst uh, all the things going through our minds right now, we want to ask, please, Heavenly Father, would you give us Uh, spirit-enabled concentration, not just simply to understand these words, but even more significantly than that, to apply them to our lives, we pray. Ask us, uh, we ask you this morning that you would not leave us unchanged or unchallenged by your word as we hear it this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let me introduce you to uh, a mythical character called Gary. It's quite difficult at church. You have to pick names that you don't think relate to anybody particularly. Gary is 14. Now, probably don't call 14-year-olds Gary anymore. They did in my day. Anyway, and more than anything, Gary wants an iPhone 12 Pro. That is his desire above all things, right? He's he's read the uh, reviews on the internet. Some of his mates have already got one, and he really, really wants an iPhone 12 Pro. His desire above anything is to get that phone. But being 14, one crucial piece of information is this. He does not in himself have the means to pay the £1,000 price tag that there is on such a phone. So Gary does what any other thinking 14-year-old does at that stage. He devotes himself to the only means that he possibly has of achieving his desire above all things, which is what? His parents, nagging his parents, yeah? My desire above all things is an iPhone 12. The only means that I have is my parents. I will nag them until they give me the iPhone 12 Pro. So, mum, 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 will you buy me an iPhone? Mum! Will you buy me a... Dad, Dad, it's my birthday coming up. How about if I combine my Christmas and my birthday presents from now until I'm 21? Will you then buy me the iPhone 12 Pro that I so desire? Well, listen, if in any way you relate to Gary this morning, then you will immediately understand our passage that we've read together this morning because Isaiah 61 and 62 is painting for us a picture that's way better. I know this is difficult for some of you to manage. Way better than iPhone 12 Pro. Something beautiful and brilliant is captured in these chapters. Something that actually encompasses everything good that we've ever experienced. A place of peace and victory, of love and joy, of justice and rightness. A place where suffering is done away with, sadness gone. And like Gary with his iPhone iPhone 12 Pro, it's a place which is way beyond any of our means. And so Isaiah ends our passage with us devoting ourselves to the only means that we have of receiving such a thing, which is asking God for it. Give God no rest. Look at verses 6 and 7 of chapter 62. On your walls, O Jerusalem, I have set watchmen all the day and all the night, that they shall never be silent. You who put the Lord in remembrance, take no rest. And give him no rest until he establishes Jerusalem and makes it's a praise in the earth. Do you see this? Watchmen on the walls looking out for the fulfillment of all that God has promised. 
asking that the Lord would establish Jerusalem. In other words, that he would bring this place of final glory, of wonder and peace that he's been talking about, dominated by the presence of his anointed king, the suffering servant. And all I want us to do for the next few moments is just look through the passage and see together what is it that is so brilliant that we should give God no rest as we ask for it. And so I've got four things that are uh, brilliant about this place that he's describing, and then I'm going to talk at the end just a little bit about why we might not desire it quite as we should. So first things first. First one, comfort for the broken, verses 1 to 3. Now, it's worth noting that much of our passage this morning is in the voice of the anointed one, who is introduced in these opening verses. And the mood music of Isaiah's book has changed from the the minor key of the suffering servant to now the major key of the songs for the anointed king. So if you remember back to my overview of Isaiah, we're now in the final section of his book and we are waiting for the coming powerful king. And that's the big theme. And this anointed king is the one who, verse 1, brings good news for the poor, Look down at the passage, binds up the brokenhearted, proclaims liberty to the captives, the year of the Lord's favor. He brings the day of vengeance of God. He comforts the mourning. He pours on their heads the oil of gladness, making them sing instead of fail. In Luke chapter 4, as Marco has also pointed out to us, we discover beyond doubt that this is Jesus being talked about as he reads this passage in the synagogue and says, this is me. These words are about me. We haven't got time to turn to it now. Perhaps you could uh, write it down and make a note of it later. But importantly, when Jesus quotes this passage, he stops after the first clause in verse 2. So he says, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Stop. And he doesn't go on to say, the day of the vengeance of our God. Why? Well, because as we've seen in Isaiah already several times, from Isaiah's point in history, he sees the first coming and the second coming of the Lord Jesus as a single event. He sees them happening together. And Jesus Christ points to the fact that those are actually separated. Yes, I've come now to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. I will come again, says Jesus, to bring the day of vengeance of our God. But today, he's bringing good news to poor sinners, proclaiming the time, the season of God's favor. And that is our time now. We live, don't we, between this first coming of the Lord Jesus and his return in glory, which means that for us now is the time where it is possible for us to receive this liberation from sin and guilt, from the horrors of what we've done. You know, the things that play on our mind over and over and over again and condemn us in the night as we lie down and think about what we said. Why did I say that? Why did I do that? Why am I like that? Why am I nowhere near the person who I want to be? Jesus comes and liberates us from that kind of guilt, opens the prison to those bound in their guilt and facing the just condemnation, not only of their own conscience, but of a holy God. The time is now, says Jesus even while we still wait for the day of the vengeance of God, which is still to come. A day in the future when he tells us that the, uh, those who mourn will be comforted, when the ash of sadness will be swapped for a headdress of thankfulness, praise will swap out for fainting, and God's people will be like solid oaks of righteousness, unmoved and perfected through the work of the Lord. Now, now the big point of this section is not for us to understand the separation of those two events. In fact, the the link between the two is significant, isn't it? Jesus' first coming promises his return. How do I know he will come again? Well, because he has already come. But Isaiah's big point is not so much that. Isaiah's big point is that you should long for the coming of Jesus. Just like the people of God in exile longed for their return from exile and the coming of the Messiah, so you and I should long for the final return of the Lord Jesus. We should be longing for this moment when he finishes what he started. So so just take a moment to look again at the images here. This is a day when final justice is done. We'll consider in more detail next week what vengeance means. But this is the day when Tears are wiped from our eyes when mourning is done away with. This is the time when God's people will be solid, oak trees of righteousness, immovably in the presence of the God who made them, reflecting his glory in a remade world. 
Maybe you don't like the idea of wearing a headdress. It's not my thing either. But we need to get over that, don't we? Because the images here are to point to a fact where a a day when those who we've lost will no longer be sad or grieving. Don't you love that idea? The idea of finally being planted in the presence of the God who saved me, righteous before him because of what he's done in glory. It sounds brilliant. No more graveside weeping. No more saying goodbye. No more feeble spirits that can't seem to hang on to the right emotion for long enough. None of that. Don't you long for that day? Last week I was able to read these verses to Thelma as I was able to go and visit her. And it was just brilliant. She's longing for this longing for this day and it probably won't be long before she joins the saints around the throne pictured in revelation praising god and praying and longing for this day where the lord jesus returns so let me ask you what about you do you want this is this what you're longing for second image of what we desire is this it's vindication for the persecuted verses four to nine In the next little section, I think what we've got is an exchange between the anointed king and God the Father. So the anointed one spells out the effect of his arrival on the people. So beyond the things that we've already seen, here we get a people rebuilding the city with their former enemies in verse 5, serving them. It's an image of the reversal of fortunes, isn't it? The, uh, The weak become the powerful, the persecuted become the powerful, the powerful become the servants. More than that, the people of God become the means by which the world hears the gospel. As in verse 6, they're called priests and ministers of God, language which is echoed in the New Testament to the church, who are called a royal priesthood, declaring the excellencies of Christ. Finally, then, at the end of verse 7, you get this picture of God's people in a place of everlasting joy. As shame gives way for blessing, dishonor swaps out for rejoicing. No longer excluded, but now possessing a double portion in the land. Now, it's possible, just as I I scan through those verses really quickly, that some of the wonder and the beauty of those verses are are lost on us sitting here this morning. But if you're a North Korean Christian meeting in the woods for fear of the authorities, you read those verses and you go, this is brilliant, I want this. You know, the Nigerian Christian who's lost family to Boko Haram. The idea of this kind of blessing of a safe place of worshipping God is enough to bring tears to your eyes. And this is what we're to look forward to. This is what is promised to us. This is what we are to be longing for. Thirdly, a husband most glorious, verses 10 to 11. In these verses, the anointed king is speaking. And in a way, these verses are at the heart of the passage because the desire of these verses comes into focus the one person portrayed. Verse 10. He is rejoicing in God his Father, who's clothed him in garments of salvation, setting him up as a beautiful bridegroom, ready for a wedding, ready to meet his beautiful bride in a robe of righteousness. Amazingly here, you get a kind of window into Jesus' excitement at saving his people and meeting them in glory. The idea is that Jesus is making himself ready for a wedding that the next section, which we'll look at in a moment, gives us more detail about. The arrival of that day is... Uh, pictured in verse 11 as the sprouting of a garden where not daffodils and tulips pop up but righteousness and praise to God springs forth from the ground bringing glory to God in the nations. Again I I kind of wonder whether we really have understood this but it's worth just pondering isn't it that Isaiah is trying to use here the strongest of human emotions to tap into our desire for the Lord Jesus. You know just paint the picture with me for a moment. A bride is walking into church on the arm of her father and she glances up the aisle and she sees at the front the man of her dreams dressed in a brand new Marks and Spencer suit smiling back at her. Great locks of hair combed in beautiful array. That's what I, you know, what I was like. He's got that kind of smile on his face, love in his eyes, and she glimpses him for a moment. How does she feel? Well, she's longing, isn't she? She's running down the aisle to meet him, to be married to him. And that's really how Isaiah is painting the picture for us, that kind of longing. Those are the strings that Isaiah is playing on our heart. You know, forget the man at the front of church with hair and teeth that will fall out. Here is a groom of everybody's dreams, a perfect man 
clothed in the salvation that he's bought at the cost of his own blood, covered not with a poorly fitting Marks and Spencer suit, but with a robe of divine righteousness. Not just a good man, but a perfect man. A man surrounded with the glory of a humble, selfless sacrifice for the salvation of sinners, draped in perfection, heir to all the riches of God's glory. No one is like him. No man has ever loved a woman like this man loves you. No man has ever been able to do for his wife what this man has done for you. Importantly, Isaiah, as he points this out, is ensuring, isn't he, that we understand that the deliverance of the opening verses is only ours in the person of verses 10 and 11. In other words, our desire for an end to mourning is really rightly understood a desire for the Lord Jesus. Our desire for peace and justice is ultimately rightly a desire for the Lord Jesus. Why? Well, because it's only in him that those things are found. It's worth just taking a moment here to think about what it means for you to be a Christian. Some of you here are probably not sure whether you're really a Christian or not. Maybe you've been raised in a Christian home. You can see, you know, that the gospel is probably true. You might have even prayed a kind of sinner's prayer with your parents when you were little. Lord Jesus, please forgive me of my sin. But you're not really sure whether you meant it or whether you're really Christian. Well, listen, if that's you or you can relate to any of that this morning, this is really helpful, isn't it, here? Because Isaiah's point is that being part of God's people is not simply about praying a prayer or believing a set of truths to be true. It's not even about who your parents are. Instead, being a Christian is much more like falling in love. It's about seeing not only that you can trust Jesus. Get this, because this is really important. It's not just that you can trust Jesus, that he is who he says he is. It's that you want to, more than anything, trust in Jesus. That you see the wonder of who he is and what he's done. You see, this is the kind of person I want to live my life for, who I want to trust. This is the kind of saviour who I want to give myself to. You know, the, the great test to know whether you're a Christian is not to go digging in your heart to see whether you really meant it when you prayed a prayer. Instead, it's about looking at Jesus and seeing his beauty and saying, I want to follow him. I love him. Well, I hope that helps you if you're thinking about what it really means for you to be a Christian this morning. Seeing that Jesus not only can save you, but that you want him above all things to save you. Final thing, the fourth one, is the wedding of all time in verses 1 to 5 of chapter 62. Really, this just carries on that theme, doesn't it? But here in these final verses, the camera turns from the groom to the bride and to the joy of the wedding. Here we find that it's not only the groom that's clothed in righteousness, but his bride too. And amazingly, in these verses, just as God's people are longing for this final wedding day, so it's the anointed one in these verses who won't keep quiet with the Lord giving his bride a new name, which changes from forsaken and desolate to my delight is in her and married, as the new name seals the promise and confirms the bride's new status. In verse 3, the people of God marrying the son are pictured as wearing a a crown of beauty, a royal crown. And then in verse 5, we're told that God will rejoice over us like a bridegroom over his bride. It's remarkable, isn't it? Think about it, the point here is not that God is simply willing or even just able to save us, but that he delights to save us. God will save his people as they turn to him and trust in him. That on its own is brilliant, but that God wants to save his people. It's his greatest joy to provide his bridegroom with a beautiful bride. And to take that bride from the prison of their sin and liberate them, crowning them with beauty and honor that they don't deserve so they can marry his son. In a wedding that all weddings that you've ever been to point forward to this one. Uh, Turning your Bibles just really quickly to Revelation, to the last book in the Bible, Revelation 19. And here you see John picking up these same images and talking about the return of the Lord Jesus. Look at Revelation 19. Uh, John writes this, he says, After this I heard what seemed to be uh, the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven, a swan, crying out, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for his judgments are true and just. For he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Once more they cried out, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. 
And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God, who was seated on the throne, saying, Amen, hallelujah. And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, like the sound of a mighty peal of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. Well, that's our passage this morning, isn't it? And remember how this works. That these are the things that we are to desire above all things. This is the, the, the thing of our dreams. The thing that we desire above all things is to be there at that wedding day married to that groom and so because this is the desire above all things so we are to ask of it we are to plead with the lord give him no rest until he delivers it which is why you can summarize really in lots of ways the prayers of the new testament in simply this come lord jesus but before we finish it struck me studying and preparing for this over the last couple of weeks that really our prayerlessness doesn't match up really to verses six and seven do they you know as as much as i see parts of this i don't think verses six and seven really describe our church life perhaps as much as they could i mean we, we do see glimpses of it which is great but if i'm honest even about my own life i don't think that i am giving god no rest or pleading with him for the coming of the lord jesus quite in the way that the passage suggests that we should now the passage helps me with that not because it beats me with a stick and says, hey, Steve, pray some more, pray some more, pray some more. No, not like that. Instead, it tells us that our prayerlessness is a function of not desiring the right things. We don't pray because we don't want. We don't pray enough because we don't want enough. You know, we, we pray for inconsequential things because our wants are shallow and not Christ-centered. So let me just try and speak to that for a few moments, if I can, before we finish. I want to just pick up three failures in our desires, which I think the passage addresses directly. So here you go, the first one, perhaps suffering just feels too deep. I'm sure this is true for some people in the room and watching this morning. The suffering of our lives and of the moments that we're in just feels so deep and so real that the prospect, as you read it, of a gladness instead of mourning is just impossible to conceive. And even if you can conceive it, it's so difficult to imagine why God would make you wait for it. Why would my experience now be one of fainting and crying when I know from the passage that the Lord wants ultimately to bring me to a place of comfort and joy? Well, listen, if that's how you feel this morning, my heart goes out to you. The Lord only knows the whys and wherefores of your situation. I don't. And you and I might never know either. But the point of Isaiah seems to be that just like the servant, so for his people. So the servant suffers in Isaiah 53 and then is exalted and glorified in the chapters that follow. So you and I, his people, suffer now with a glory still to come. And as real and as deep as that suffering is, and as real as those tears are, still, that real still is the comfort that we find in this passage. How? Well, because incredibly, in the gap between verse 2, part A, and verse 2, part B, where Jesus begins and ends his quote, is the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, where bodily Jesus rose from the grave, triumphant over death and sin, before ascending into glory, which means that your tears will be wiped away because Jesus rose. The suffering of this moment will pass, we will look back at the griefs and sorrows of now as being momentary compared to the eternal glories to come because Jesus rose. I think the second failure in our desires comes when temporary solutions satisfy. It was C.S. Lewis who pointed out that the failure in our desires is not that they're too deep to be met by the gospel, but they're so shallow that they're met by this world. And that's the point here. You see in verses 4 to 9 of chapter 61, God writes all wrongs. Yeah? You and I are only really bothered by the wrongs that wrong us, yeah? 
You know, we care about robbery when we're the ones being robbed. But God cares about it all. And you and I, we can't even think about it, can we? Because we just cannot carry the weight of the sin and the suffering in our world. The injustice is horrendous. Just think about it for a moment, the injustice and the wickedness playing out in places like Myanmar or Belarus or Venezuela or Burkina Faso or eastern Ukraine or northern Korea or China. Just imagine the, the numbers of people suffering in the injustices of those places. And God knows about all of it and feels it all personally as an affront to who he is. And one day he will sort it out. You know, all I want is a nice holiday or a new toy. And I've set my sights way too low. I care about too little and I've become too easily satisfied. And Isaiah 61 invites us to dream much bigger than that. You know, invites us to pray more than a relief from a sore toe or praying that Jesus would help me concentrate in my exams, as important as that might feel it is. But he invites you to pray for a world where nothing wrong ever happens again. A world where all this mess is done away with. And he says, don't you want that? Don't you want that? Well, God does. But I wonder if the biggest failure in our desires is that if we're honest, Jesus doesn't seem that beautiful to us. I wonder if maybe for a moment I can preach to myself and you guys can just listen in. I was thinking about this as I was walking the dog this week. We've been away on holiday for a few days camping. It seems like everybody in the country is going camping at the moment. You know, we did it even before it was cool. But we were, I was out walking the dog early one morning before anybody was up on the campsite and trying to think through the applications of this passage. And I think that this is the problem that I have. I think that Steve doesn't think very much about the whole idea of loving Jesus or of being the bride of Christ. You know, I get excited by the intellectual satisfaction of the consistency of the gospel. It's amazing. When you think about it, how the gospel answers the deepest questions of all our hearts is incredible. There is nothing like it. The idea that the Bible, written over thousands of years, holds together as a single unit of story is mind-blowing. The fact that you can put your finger in Isaiah 61 and turn to Luke 4 and find the same passage is just astounding. But seeing that is not living the Christian life, is it? And I get excited about those things. But the truth is it won't make me pray like Isaiah 62 because what I really need to see is not that Jesus is intellectually satisfying to my deeply held questions, but that Jesus is lovely and beautiful to be adored and loved. That the desires of my heart to be loved and to love, to know and be known, to be wanted, to be cared for, to be fulfilled, to be secure, all those are found in this wonderful Saviour, clothed in righteousness and salvation, bearing in his hands and on his feet the marks of his love for me. I can't even conceive of the rejoicing over me in the glories of heaven, waiting for his bride to be made ready for the final day of victory. You know, if I would get that, dare I say it, if you would get that this morning, you and I would pray like a lover talks to her beloved. You know, like a, a fiancé who's constantly texting her husband-to-be, turning to him in every moment, seeking his presence and his blessing at all times. Why? Well, because our desire for him is above all things. Uh, turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. Let me just try and show you this in 1 Peter chapter 1. If you've got a Bible like mine, it's on page 1014. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 to 9. This is how Peter describes the Christian life. He writes this. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it's tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honour at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, 
you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. A guy called John Flavel, who was a, I think, or Flavel, depending on how you want to say it, was a Puritan who wrote a short book called Altogether Lovely, reflecting on the beauty of Jesus. And in his final chapter, which he calls Application, he writes this. Let me just read this to you as I close. He says this. Is Jesus Christ altogether lovely? Then I beg you set your souls upon this lovely Jesus. I am sure such an object has been here represented, would compel love from the coldest breast and hardest heart. Away with those empty nothings. Away with this vain, deceitful world, which deserves not the thousandth part of the love that you give it. Let all stand aside and give way to Christ. Oh, if only you knew his worth and excellency, what he is in himself, what he has done for you and deserved from you, you would need no arguments of mine to persuade you to love him. Let me pray for us as we close. Heavenly Father, as we consider this passage, we want to pray, come Lord Jesus. Please, we pray, bring the fulfillment of these verses that we've seen. Bring at the end to all injustice and suffering. Bring your uh, bridegroom, the Lord Jesus, that we might be in this great wedding day that all of history has been waiting for and pointing to And Lord, we realise that we fail to desire that above all things. So please, we pray, move our hearts to love Jesus, to see his beauty and his glory afresh, that in our hearts we would love him and that we would spend our time living for his glory in all the different places that you put us. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, the band are going to play for us, but we're going to stand and follow along with the words... Um, Awake, awake, O Zion, and clothe yourself with strength. Shake off your dust and fix your eyes on him. So as they sing, let's follow the words in our minds and our hearts and praise God together. Let's stand.
by reading some words from Zephaniah. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. Lord God, we thank you that you have made yourself known to us. In the world you have made through your word and through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. We praise you for who you have shown yourself to be. Mighty, faithful, just, powerful, merciful, loving and wise. We are sorry that even though we have seen something of you, we are so often forgetful of you. Please, by your spirit, cause us to respond to you with love and praise and obedience. We thank you that through Jesus you have shared with us yourself and the riches of knowing you, even though we had rejected you. Thank you that your character gives us confidence that what you've promised you will do. Therefore, we ask that you would make us as individuals and as a church body more like you, that we might better bring you glory. As we consider the call to hospitality in connect groups, Give us willingness and joy in sharing, sharing the love you have shown us with one another and give us creativity, wisdom and humility in how best to do that. Please use that book and the discussions and actions it prompts to help us build one another up in you. And as we enjoy greater freedoms than we've had for the last year or so, cause us to give you thanks for them and not take them for granted. Give us patience with one another as we adjust. And please sustain those who are still feeling restricted, for example, by poor physical health. We thank you that Thelma is out of hospital and ask that you will grant her your peace in abundance and sustain her and hold her close to you. As the world seems to offer more hope again in terms of the battle against COVID, help us to remember that true hope is found only in you. Would you give us great delight and willingness to share that hope with others? Help us to pray faithfully and speak boldly. We thank you that our mum and baby and children's and youth groups can meet again in person. Would they be both an encouragement to your people and a light to those who don't yet know you? Further afield, we pray for Holy Foundation Baptist Church in Mongolia, that they would see the hope you offer clearly and delight in it. Be with them as they seek to share you in a community hard hit by COVID. Give them love and strength to persevere and give their elders wisdom and faithfulness. Lord, cause righteousness and praise to sprout up in us and across the nations, to your glory, and through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us and will come again. Amen. We're going to continue praying now as we say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, 
Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, let me finish our service by reading uh, the words from the end of uh, Jude. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Saviour, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Well, that brings our service this morning to a close. Uh, I want to give you a reminder that tonight at 6pm is our monthly Zoom prayer meeting. Uh, so please join us for that. Uh, and then I'm going to dismiss you row by row. Um, and if you can make sure that you're not congregating on the steps or outside, uh, that, would be, that would be brilliant. So Sam's going to open the doors. And I'm going to say, see you to row A. Apparently you're A. Uh, thanks for coming, guys. Normally I'm over there waving frantically. <laughs> And then if the next row wants to uh, leave, thank you very much. See you later. And the next row, thanks Dan. <laughs> I feel like, Steve, are you doing the job that I should have done? Yeah. Are you not? If anybody wants to help take away chairs in the final three rows, that would be brilliant. The Moss family, brilliant, well done. Anybody else? <laughs> and the Schnellskis, thank you so much. Um, so if the next row would like to go, that'd be great, thanks. <laughs> I feel like I kind of backed you into a corner there. I'm sorry. <laughs> Tactics. And then the next row... Thank you. And the next row can go. Wow. Feeding out well now. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. That's everyone. Pretty much. <laughs> great. Thanks, guys.